This is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nation Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering six conversations from our two-day coverage of the Liver Meeting 2022 and, instead of the vault, an interview with m Pharmaceuticals Chief Medical Officer Michael Corman and Stephen Harrison. In this conversation, Stephen Harrison provides more detail on the two late-breaking papers he had presented the day before, with a major focus on the Afruxifermin Phase 2B trial. We discussed the results of this trial during S3E48, the WOW episode, so I won't repeat them here. At the end of providing his data, however, two important points emerge. First, Stephen and Jorn Schottenberg share the idea that not all FGF21s are created equal. FGF21s themselves need to be stabilized due to their two-hour half-lives. And the first FGF21, Peg Belfermin, was a pegylated FGF21 that revealed significant challenges in clinical development. Afruxifermin itself is a bivalent structure, two molecules stabilized by a fusion protein that appears to work far better. Conversation continues with more points and questions about the study results and their implications. One noteworthy point, as in our previous conversation of the mitochondrial uncoupler. This one swings around to the view that afruxifermin might function better as an induction therapy to be followed by an oral maintenance therapy rather than as a long-term monotherapeutic agent. One question around that might have to do with anti-drug antibodies, which is discussed during this portion of the conversation. With over 7,000 on-site attendees and tremendous amounts of positive energy, the Liver Meeting 22 produced exciting presentations, fantastic debates, and searing insights. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, Catch everything in this series from us. And when you're done, join the discussion on our LinkedIn discussion group. Stephen, you take a minute and walk us through the high points of the two late breakers you presented yesterday. We talk a little bit also about Regenerate and and, and see what we can come to on that issue. Stephen Harrison. Yeah, all right. Let me just start with the Acaro data with the Fruxifermin. If we have time, maybe we can come back around to another therapeutic. Fruxifermin is an FGF21 agonist. And the reason why we like it is FGF21 is an endogenous metabolic hormone that regulates energy expenditure, glucose, and lipid metabolism. And so it's an attractive target. The problem with native FGF21 is a short half-life of only about two hours. So you've got to do something to extend the half-life of that drug. And Afruxifermin has kind of a unique structure that no other FGF21 in development has in the sense that it has a bivalent component to it. In other words, there are two FGF21 molecules linked together by an FC fusion protein. It also has some point mutations on it. And what that essentially allows you to do is there's a greater affinity and stable binding to the receptor. So it sticks around a, a bit longer. And, you know, there's been data already presented on this from a previous trial called Balanced. It's a phase 2A trial. And in that trial, which was with any 2A trial, shorter duration, certainly less than 24 weeks, but, and it was all driven by non-invasive assessment. There were biopsies done, but that was not the primary endpoint of the 2A trial. But based on the prior assessment in the 2A trial, the Harmony trial was designed, which is a very classic phase 2B double-blind randomized placebo-controlled multi-centered trial of two different doses of afruxifermin, 50 milligrams and 28 milligrams versus placebo. This is actually built to be a two-year study. If you hearken back to the Pivens trial, the last time we had a two-year study was that long ago, published in 2010 New England Journal. The duration of the trial is pretty long. Biopsies to get in, biopsies to get out in 96 six weeks, but there was an interim assessment at 24 weeks. And believe it or not, that was the primary endpoint was assessment at 24 weeks, looking at histology. And it was driven by fibrosis, improvement of at least one stage with no worsening of NASH. So the type of patients that were put into the trial were the ones we were just talking about, the NAS of four more with F2, F3 fibrosis. They also had an additional gating to get in of a MRI PDFF of at least 8%. So just to jump to the chase, 128 patients were randomized, 113 were analyzed because that's the number where we had 24-week liver biopsies. So that's called the liver biopsy analysis set. Now that wasn't an ITT set. This was a responder analysis, but it was an a priori analysis. It was in the statistical analysis plan to do it 
this way rather than ITT because of the small numbers relative to the trial design size. But interestingly, in the Q&A, I didn't get asked about ITT, but we can talk about that here if somebody would like to discuss that. Baseline demographics, 70% diabetic, 70% had F3 fibrosis. And another interesting fact about the way this study was read out is it's really kind of the first time we're seeing consensus biopsy analysis. Now, I know Regenerate also did it. That was presented later in the same segment of the meeting. But the idea here is two different pathologists read each biopsy and scored each slide. And if they agreed, that was the final score. If they differed, they came together and reviewed the slide digitally over Zoom and reached consensus. If they could not reach consensus, a third pathologist was brought in to adjudicate the differences. Really quickly, the primary endpoint was met. So both doses were statistically significantly superior to placebo, and the treatment effect delta at the highest dose was 21%. For NASH resolution, there was a nice stepwise increase. Placebo, 15%, low dose 47, high dose 76, giving you a treatment effect delta of 61% for resolution of NASH at the high dose. And then just diving into that a little bit more, the more stringent composite endpoint of both fibrosis improvement and NASH resolution, building off Sven's work with lanafibrinor, showing a positive impact there, 41% for high dose, 5% for placebo. And the other thing that you see here is when you go to a more stringent endpoint, placebo response is harder to achieve, so it's much lower. And then about 15 to 16% of the patients had a two-stage improvement in fibrosis compared to 5% for placebo. So that's all that I presented on histology when we looked at comparators with uh, some of the non-invasive markers for fibrosis. You see very nice reductions in Pro-C3, ELF score, and liver stiffness by KPA. Liver fat was significantly reduced in line with what we'd shown previously. But building on this idea that 30% relative drop in liver fat is kind of a low bar, we know that the more fat you lose, the greater the odds you have improvement in histology. So we wanted to look at patients that lost more than 50% of the liver fat. You see that about 63 to 77% did that. And then we looked at those that completely normalized liver fat, or at least went to less than or equal to 5%. And it was none of the placebo, 34 low dose, 51% in the high dose. If you're a person that follows liver chemistry tests, there was a very rapid and sustained reduction in both ALT and AST dose response wise, achieving 47% relative drop or a 33 unit absolute drop with the high dose with ALT. And I think probably more important is this drop in AST. It was 28 units per liter with the high dose, which was a 49% drop, which I thought was pretty impressive. Tolerability, uh, generally well tolerated in line with what we see with injectables, generally mild transient uh, diarrhea, nausea. There was one drug-related serious adverse event. It was an ulcerative esophagitis case. There were a couple discontinuations in the low and high dose group for various reasons that we can talk about if you'd like. But lipoprotein profiles were good here. Triglyceride drops were around 25 to 30%. HDL cholesterol rose around 24 to 30%. Not a bunch of movement in LDL cholesterol. It was down about 8% in the treated groups. And then HbA1c, remember 70% of these people were diabetic. There was still about a half a point drop in the type 2 uh, subset. These are people that 14% were on GLP-1s, still seeing an additional drop there. Uh, C-peptide dropped and basically correlating with improvement in insulin sensitivity. There was a weight change, positive weight change in the high dose group of around 2.6% improvement, which we didn't see with the low dose or with placebo. So I think these data are very promising. I think it gives us enough data to move forward with this compound in phase three. So I think you might see this be the first FGF21 that goes into phase three sometime in 2023. So let me stop there and, and see what people uh, want to say about it. That was a lot of data, Stephen. Congratulations. Yeah, thank, I think, you know, it's a team effort, right? A lot of work done by a lot of people to, to put this together and bring it forward. And we had a lot of promise and hope in FGF 21s. And I think the, the first time around, we were a little uh, disappointed with what ha we saw with Peg Belferman. And there was some current concerns about tachyphylaxis. A lot of that has been put to bed. And maybe it just reflects that not all FGF 21s are created equal. You know, and the target is a good target, but you have to structure your chemical entity 
appropriately to have sustained binding so you know that it sticks around long enough to do something positive. The other thing I didn't mention here is the target engage. There actually is a marker of target engagement for this class of molecules, and that's a diponectin that uh, went up significantly. And there was actually a separate poster here. Gosh, uh, Sven, it was the lanafibrinor data, right? Where upregulation of a diponectin of more than 60% actually correlated to improvement in histology. Sven Frank. Absolutely. And I think you also hit a very important point, Stephen, that is that not all these molecules, although they belong to the same class, are created equal. It's really about receptor engagement and, and then downstream targets activated or less activated. All of these compounds in all of these classes can have a, a slightly different profile, but that can have substantial impact on, on the overall results. Jörn Schattenberg. So my, my question here, uh, Stephen, I'm not sure, you know, is that related to how FGF, how that agonist binds, or is it related to the pegulation and the, the PK and the extended availability, if you look at other FGF21s? Well, they're all relatively, well, not relatively, they're significantly different. You know, peg belferman is a pegylated compound, and it didn't stick around that long, actually. The fruxifermin is once weekly. It has a relatively long half-life. This bivalent structure of that, there was actually a poster, poster 5051, if you want to go back uh, for our listeners and take a look at it, that dives into this bivalent structure a bit more. That's maybe the secret sauce to that entity is it really allows for stable binding and it allows it to stick around and have its action for for a while. And we don't have anti-drug antibodies yet from the balance trial. It's something that, of course, is being looked at closely, but if you are from the Harmony trial, but if you go back to the balance trial, we do have the ADAs. And while about 70% had anti-drug antibodies, it was a very, very sensitive assay, but there was low titer. They were directed to EFX directly, and it didn't seem to impact a diponectin expression. So if you look at ALT trends here, the rapid and sustained out to 24 weeks, we're not seeing a rise towards the end of that. Same thing with MRI PDFF. So, you know, we have to track that out further. It'd be interesting to see what the 96-week ADAs look like or tachyphylaxis, but at least at 24 weeks, I don't believe we're seeing what was seen with the BMS compound. Stephen, would that imply, forgetting about 96 weeks for a second, uh, one of the questions you were asked yesterday and answered, we've talked about this some on the podcast, is the right use for a drug like this, which might be induction therapy. Will the 96-week result actually affect its appropriateness in induction therapy as compared to longer-term or maintenance therapy? Well, what's going to be important important, Rogers, to see, you know, are we able to keep these patients on drug out to 96 weeks? You know, if you look at any injection, I, I guess claims data from the GLP-1s, people tend to fall off the wagon over time. And the, you know, they're not renewing their medications as frequently. I don't know the exact number, but I've seen data, if I recall, around 50% drop off at one year in people that are continuing to take these injectables. So obviously studies are a bit different. Uh, we're more stringent in our follow-up and, and hopefully Hopefully we have most people stay on drug. My initial impression of the way we'll use these injectables is probably more of short-term use and use it more aggressively in people that have more advanced disease and try to get them under control and then switch them over to a better tolerated longer acting oral or not longer acting, but a, but a drug that could be used for the long haul that, that people could tolerate better. So I'm, maybe I'm a little myopic in that opinion. I'd love to hear my colleagues' views. I think it's an excellent way of thinking. What we are not knowing for the moment yet, if we have a substantial improvement of the liver condition and a kind of reset, how quickly the disease reappears if the metabolic driving factors are, are still there. That That's an uncertain and I think very interesting question, but only from experience with patients, you sometimes have the impression that some of these patients have quite good reset of their disease and it takes quite long before they regain indices of, of more severe liver disease, although the treatment has been stopped and they still continue to have overweight and diabetes. So the dynamics of what happens when you have reset the disease to a point where there is far less uh, liver damage and activity is, is still an unknown to me, but an important thing to investigate. No, I think we have to await for that data and the anti-drug and that class are, of course, something that we'll have to look for. I was compelled and I ask you that question by the low placebo response when you actually go for the more stringent endpoints. And if you talk to EMEA these days, it's something they're still looking at and it's achievable. That's the other thing in this phase too. You get a 36 to 40% difference in treatment versus placebo. So uh, 
I found that was very interesting. It kind of the same way what Sven says. I mean, patients are doing things. That's why I was wondering, what are the predictors in these patients that respond in placebo hitting both of these endpoints? And, and that's probably weight loss and change in lifestyle. That might not always be uh, captured in all cases, I guess. But we do know that at least we did do a subset analysis on weight, and that didn't impact here. There was 14% of the people on GLP-1s. That didn't impact. 44% were on statins, and we you do a responder analysis on statins. That didn't impact fibrosis improvement one way or the other. I just think we need to continue to mine the data a bit more, but it's it's certainly a very positive class of drugs to continue to look at and figure out where we're going to put them. I think Sven's comment about how quickly this comes back is a good one, and the only insight I have from that is one of the trials we did with Aldefermin and NGM, we actually had six-week follow-up MRIs. We saw some liver fat coming back at six weeks, but what was completely flat was ALT. So to your point, we might take a while to reset the underlying inflammation and damage, even though maybe isolated steatosis begins to filter back in. Just another important point to come back to Jorn's comment about the combined endpoint. I think that makes a lot of sense because uh, you can have, of course, regression of steatohepatitis and it may take longer to have an impact on fibrosis. But the other way around, having a substantial impact on fibrosis without having an impact on steatohepatitis is quite unlikely. And only if you have really pure antifibrotic targets and even even with, with the beticolic acid although it did not hit the end point of Nash resolution there was improvements in the features of steatohepatitis so I think combining the two substantially reduces the placebo rates and gives a more comprehensive view on, on what is really happening and on the quite intimate link between steatohepatitis and fibrosis so it makes absolutely sense to combine these two endpoints into one combined. And now, back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next Wednesday evening with a wrap-up episode, taking a look at some of the highlights of the meeting from the perspective of folks we may not have heard from yet, including Will Alazawi, who's been with us once, and Moran Costera, who's never been with us before. It's going to be a fantastic session. Until then, stay safe, surf hot. Look forward to seeing you again next week on the podcast. Bye-bye now.